Hello, everyone. Time for our next unit. Uh, two lectures, one on Archie Comics uh, and one on the rise of kid comics in the last 20 years, how these events are related. Um, let's go ahead and jump. We're going to do Archie first. So let's hit the old screen share. And away we go. So the official title of this is The Gendering of Comics and How Archie Bridged the Gap. Oops. So as we talked about in the first lecture, uh, there are a lot of comics aimed at boys and girls of various ages because publishers were interested in getting it all these audiences, uh, something not necessarily uh, understood or acknowledged was that historically girls and women have always read and were willing to buy books and magazines more than men and boys. Uh, and yet with money to be made, this, uh, this knowledge is, was ignored for a long time. But here's some classics uh, aimed at girls, Little Lulu, um, uh, created by Marge, but best known for John Stanley and Irving Tripp, creating a, a whole host of hilarious characters. Um, one of the most rereadable kids comics of all time. Um, and from the Harvey group, we got little Dot, little Lotta, and little Audrey, um, all funny, all extremely well drawn, um, beautiful looking comics um, from Sid Couchy in the 1950s. Uh, he had a particular style and was great at it. Uh, Marvel at the time, as a company that was trying to find its footing and um, hadn't yet embraced superhero comics, uh, they were known for doing monster comics and a lot of comics aimed at girls. Um, foremost was Patsy Walker, um, who went out uh, a teenager who was somewhat famous and went out and had all sorts of adventures. And uh, she was later brought back as a superhero in the 70s. Another Marvel comic, Millie the Model. Um, lots of comics had loved emphasizing fashion and clothing, and they had a lot of artists who were really good at drawing it. Um, and some who uh, were later kind of pushed to draw superheroes who weren't great at that, but have them draw like a suit or a dress, like someone like Don Heck, and mm, look great. The, the point is that there was during this period, um, everyone was pushing comics to boys and girls. And even if the way they're aiming them at girls was somewhat uh, stereotypical, um, they're at least recognizing them as an audience that needed to be served. That all changed in the 60s with the dawn of the superhero era. But let's take a Let's take a trip back, shall we? Um, there, of course, in the 30s and 40s was National, who'd become DC, and Timely, who would uh, later become Marvel, and many others. Uh, Fawcett, who did Captain Marvel, was, uh, was the other really big one. But there are a lot of smaller joints because, as I mentioned before, Anyone who could put together a studio and uh, exploit young labor and make money was going to do it. So here we have MLJ Publishing, founded in 1939. This was their first comic, Blue Ribbon Comics, number one. Uh, so there's a character there who's an obvious ripoff of Phantom. 
there's a dog in, in the dog in there um, named Rangatang, which had nothing to do with the most famous dog in the world, Lin Tin Tin. Um, and so they were basically exploiting every available property they could think of, copying them in, in an effort to get attention. Well, another comic they put out was Pep Comics, and they had their own superheroes. This is The Shield. Uh, the Shield, this patriotic character, preceded Captain America by nearly a year and was one of several superheroes they had who were not especially popular in comparison to other superheroes, but you know they, they sold reasonably well just at that time. Well, they did other stories in Pep Comics too. Uh, and in issue number 22, they introduced a character named Archie. Um, drawn by uh, Bob, Mon Bob Montana. And uh, it's interesting to look at the coloring and the rendering here um, because Archie is pretty buff here compared to like kind of slightly more nebbishy guy he'd be, but the logo is exactly the same. Um, and the story introduced Archie there's Betty looking much more like a bombshell than the more wholesome version she'd become. And Jughead, uh, familiar characters. And why was he, why is this version of Archie kind of um, rakish? Well, again, this was based on something else. Archie was based on the Andy Hardy movies, which were extremely popular in the 1940s, starring Mickey Rooney, who got to start as a child actor, uh, and dealing with all sorts of girls. And um, as you can see, there's a real, real deliberate uh, resemblance, the redheaded Archie and the redheaded Andy Hardy. And um, a lot of the early stories were kind of taken from these kinds of adventures. Um, as the series proceeded, uh, the style and the aesthetic changed a little bit. It became cartoonier. That early, really granular level of coloring that we can see here, this looks like something out of, the richness of the color looks like something out of a Frank King Gasoline Alley Sunday strip. It's so vivid in your face. Um, but this is the flatter coloring that I think we tend to associate with Archie. Um, and Bob Montana was a really good artist. Um, although it's not quite as the the branding here is not quite quite yet what we understand what Archie would become. Here's more Bob Montana. Here he gets a little cartoonier. And yet more Bob Montana introducing uh, Archie's adventures in school. And then there's Veronica and her dad. Um, and for those who've never seen Archie comic, uh, and I have no idea what I'm talking about. It's it's basically sort of what I'm alluding to. It's about uh, a wholesome all-American teenager who goes to Riverdale High in some American small town, and he his best friend is a weirdo named Jughead who loves hamburgers. Um, his rival is a rich guy named Reggie, and there are two girls. Who, that he is smitten with and vice versa. Uh, wholesome girl next door named Betty and uh, the rich, rich kind of vampy Veronica. And there are others, but that's the core. Um, and the adventures here were pretty gentle. Um, not 
in the least bit edgy like a lot of material of this era was. This is aimed at teenagers, young people, basically, um, for uh, to provide you know nice, wholesome, funny, you know, very, very mildly rebellious adventures. Well, in the 1950s, as we've talked about, uh, there are a series of hearings in the United States and a general backlash against comic books because they were regarded as a direct cause of juvenile delinquency. They made the kids go bad. Uh, and they were influenced by all the bad things in them. And a senator named Estes Kefauer trotted out a bunch of publishers and the publisher of EC Comics, which was doing horror comics and mad various other things, making a lot of money, uh, absolutely was horrible under pressure. Um, well, the government never did anything about this. Instead, the pressure of these hearings, the, a group of publishers kind of caved and agreed to um, have before all their comics were published to have them examined by a new authority that they gave uh, jurisdiction to, the Comics Code Authority, to give their seal of approval. And technically you could print a comic without the Comics Code seal of authority, except that you ran the risk of advertisers not wanting to advertise in your comic, which was basically a death knell for printing or for publishing your comic. Um, and the comics code, as I've talked about repeatedly, uh, set the industry back in a similar way that the Hays Code in Hollywood set the film industry back. That lasted for 35 years did the Hays Code and the Comics Code Authority was based on it um, pretty directly. And, you know, it basically, uh, nudity, sexuality, extreme violence, the supernatural, all these things were banned. You couldn't, you couldn't depict them. Um, that also included things like homosexuality, which they considered this to be uh, any kind of sexuality was, or mention of it, was strictly verboten. Who was the person who ran the Comics Code Authority? A man named John Goldwater. Who was John Goldwater? Why, he was the editor-in-chief of MLJ, the publisher of Archie. And it is understood that he and others were going after EC um, and going after the more sensational and better selling comics. And it worked. John Goldwater was the president of the Comics Code Authority for 25 years, 1954 to 1979. And that was the heyday of the code. I mentioned this because Go back here. In the 40s and now the 50s, where things are starting to get we're starting to get a little edgier in terms of popular culture. Uh, he was able they're able to maintain the same aesthetic and kind of story that they were doing before. And they re remained extremely successful. In fact, more so. And one of the reasons is because MLJ and Archie, uh, and in fact, the company just renamed itself Archie Comics at a certain point, had the good fortune to employ some of the greatest cartoonists who've ever lived. Uh, one of them was a man named Dan DiCarlo. And he is the one who set the template in many ways for Archie comics as we understand them now. Now, Montana is a good cartoonist, but he is not in DiCarlo's league, in my opinion. 
uh, look at the Carlos use of gesture in that first panel with Betty. Look at it. Look at the clarity of his line, and the way it matches so well with um, the flat use of color. Uh, look at the way he draws bodies in space. He's just an astounding gestural cartoonist. Um, here we go again. Here's more of that. Uh, again, the if you looked at these and you couldn't read English, you could understand exactly what's going on in each each panel strictly by body language, visual cues, bodies relating to each other in space. Um, you can just, I can just look at these all day long. They're just so, so appealing. And hey, you know who else found appealing? Lots of kids. Again, if you're gonna tell simple stories, you may as well have some of the best cartoonists ever to do it. DiCarlo was very um, ambitious and wanted to do other things. And based on his wife, Josie, he created a series called Josie and the Pussycats in the 60s. And it was a very clever idea because even DiCarlo could see our characters are not hip. They're the opposite of hip. And what can we do to appeal to like young people in the 60s? Well, Josie had a rock band. Um, Josie dressed differently. And again, sort of harkening back to um, Millie the Model, um, readers would often like send in designs of, uh, of clothes for Josie to wear. Um, again, beautiful gestural drawings funny drawings like panel two that's just a funny looking drawing um and uh these were also really good romance comics that like ratcheted up things a little bit from archie while still firmly in the comics code but it looked the the way that the the young women are dressed it's like it's very much he modernized this um and unfortunately, oh, here's another here's another uh, page from Josie. Um, so one thing to note is, like the Marvel and DC artists of the '60s, even when they created original characters and had them published, this was work for hire. They didn't own them. And so when eventually Josie and the Pussycats got turned into a delightfully strange movie uh, and Dan DiCarlo, who had been working continuously for Archie up in this time, uh, wanted a cut, uh, it was denied and he got fired and he died shortly afterwards. <laughs> and unfortunately not an uncommon cartoonist story. So Archie not only had the good fortune of having one of the best cartoonists ever, it had yet another one, Harry Lucy in the 1950s. Uh, his work is different than DiCarlo's. Um, it's not as, uh, the line is not as fine but there's a kinetic quality to it that's funnier. But also his gestural drawings are superb, uh, possibly even better than Carlos. And um, uh, Jaime Hernandez actually lists him as um, a big influence. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, this is one of the best gestural drawers in the world. And you can really see um, how he pulled a lot of his aesthetic from Archie Comics in general and Lucy in particular. Here's more Lucy. And again, look at these silent comics. Um, they're really funny. Uh, he has, has an excellent comedic sense of timing. Uh, his understanding of bodies in space, unmatched. So good. 
and he also drew really pretty girls, which was sort of another one of the points of Archie was uh, look at all these good looking teenagers. Um, now, in the course of Archie comics, they basically try to exploit every single character they could and giving them their own stories. So Betty got stories, Veronica got stories. And this is smart diversification because um, again, Archie was kind of aimed at everyone, but girls comics, uh, perfect way to like aim them directly at girls. Here's more Betty, uh, the next door neighbor. Um, Again, great gestural drawings. It's very funny. Here's Betty and her arch rival and frenemy, Veronica. Um, and here's a great gag for the cover. Um, and why were these comics popular? They're funny. Really great gags, really great visual gags. Um, yes, they were corny. Yes, they were old fashioned. But it was the work of the artist that kind of kept things fresh. Here's more Betty and Veronica kind of uh, perpetuating that love triangle. Um, and there's good old Jughead eating hamburgers with that bizarre crowd on his head. And Archie wears an R on his sweater for Riverdale. And Jughead wears an S on his sweater for no discernible reason. It's just a long time gag. Uh, here's the Archie gang in the 70s when there um, there is the constant worry of staying relevant um, and keeping up and finding new ways to connect with audiences. So we still have the the regular Archie gang and they added some other characters and uh, they actually introduced uh, a couple different black characters. Um, and this is around the same time that um, Lots of all white comics and strips were very consciously doing that. Here's Chuck Clayton. And uh, the cool thing about him is that he was introduced and he had a particular shtick. Chuck Clayton was an artist. He liked to draw comics. And so that was, that was his identity and it worked really well. Um, and here's Chuck in the 80s getting his own feature. Now, <laughs> MLJ was publishing Archie and they had success with that in a way, because partly because they engineered it. What they didn't see coming was the return of popularity of superheroes in 1960, roughly. First with DC and the Justice League and all reviving their golden age characters. And then with Marvel, which revived a few characters like Captain America and the Submariner, but mostly they're introducing all these new hip characters and Marvel became, uh, uh, Marvel became like culturally hip. It was like, and they really exploited that, especially in the mid sixties. Well, Archie gave it a try and brought back their characters. Uh, here we have the mighty crusaders and this note the year 1966. This is the year that Batman's TV show dropped. So you watch to see the punk, the pow, and the clunk. These were done tongue in cheek in much the same way as the Batman TV show was, uh, pointing out its own corniness. Kind of the opposite of what Marvel was doing. Marvel was like, no, our characters are cool. Um, they went the other way and uh, did not work, did not last long. Um, some of these some of the books look really good but no one was really interested um archie sought to continue to diversify in the 70s there was a cartoon show with lots of music and kind of pushed that element like the uh the pop band element a la the monkeys um always a formula that works so this maintains some this had some popularity and they went in other directions in terms of licensing. They had an entire line of 
uh, Evangelical Comics. This is Archie Sunshine. Uh, and uh, the Archie characters getting into various adventures. And here we've got kind of a unfortunate stereotypical image um, talking about pagans and uh, various people talking about, you know, praying to the real God. Here's perhaps my favorite image. Um, that bearded guy uh, who's uh, at the beach wearing shorts and a denim jacket. Well, that's Jesus, of course, driving around in his love van and telling people to come follow him, which is perhaps not an image that they uh, quite understood how that might might be perceived later. But it was the idea was, you know, if Jesus was around, he'd be hanging out with the kids and telling them to follow him. Um, but still unintentionally hilarious. Here we've got another series, Archie's Parables, where uh, Archie starts talking about various uh, biblical things. And um, uh, he's, you know, he's yelling right at uh, Satan here. Um, and lots of prayer going on. Uh, again, Archie Comics was looking to, to get over in whatever way they could um, and kind of maintaining that uh, this is entirely, it, it's, it's, it worked because it's not a huge step to think of a wholesome Archie and his pals like going to church and talking about Jesus. Um, you know, that's why this was done. Every now and then, Archie would continue to try and um, re uh, reinvent themselves. Uh, in 2007, they abandoned the look that had been refined and perfected by DiCarlo and Lucy and others. And they gave Betty and Veronica and others a naturalistic look which uh, thinking a modern audience might find that more relatable. They did not. There is a huge outcry against this um, for dipping way too much into sort of uncanny valley imagery with these characters that we thought of in a very particular way. And they wisely abandoned it. But they didn't stop trying different ideas to modernize Archie and make it relevant. Here we've got Kevin Keller, uh, the first gay Archie character. Uh, and um, every bit as wholesome as anyone else, he just happened to be gay uh, and very popular. And, uh, and he even got to kiss a boy. Um, so kind of, it, it got all sorts of glad awards and whatnot. Uh, and in part because, again, this comic that had a very particular 1950s America wholesome aesthetic was kind of brought along with that. They still didn't tr stop trying to do superheroes. And actually, they licensed them out to uh, DC. Uh, here's the shield yet again. And again, no one was interested. It's too bad because he's a great looking character. Uh, the irony of ironies is that Archie, who helped establish the comics code as a reaction to the popularity of horror comics, uh, did with the rise of interest in zombie comics, had an Afterlife with Archie series, which is about Archie dealing with the zombie apocalypse. Now, there's a question, though. Archie was initially distributed, and again, distribution is everything, on newsstands with every, every other comic. They went after EC as a way of getting those comics off those same racks, less competition uh, against something that kids really wanted, uh, because they thought, and rightly so, that they could sell Wholesome better than most anyone else. Uh, News racks, however, uh, newsstands to get comics faded in the 70s and 80s in favor of 
um, in favor of comics stores, the creation of the direct market. And those stores primarily served superhero fans and to a lesser extent, alternative comics fans. That's where they got their comics. And you could get Archie through those stores, but it was not a popular thing. So how do they survive? How do they keep going? How do they thrive? Well, I think you'll, you'll be able to discern the clue when we look at these formats. Um, first of all, they've been constantly in the process of reprinting their greatest hits because why wouldn't you? When you've got some of the best cartoonists who ever lived, you need to like keep getting that out there in a cheap, affordable way. So this is a thousand page digest. Uh, here's Archie's double digest. Look at that, 256 pages for $2.25. This looks like it's from um, the early eighties. So two bucks on the, on the face of it's like, you know, comics were about a buck 50 at that time in general. So maybe a little more expensive, but like the average comic was two bucks or a buck 50 and 30 pages. And this is like eight times as long. So it's an incredible value. Jughead with Archie Digest. Um, this was just a dollar um, and was something probably like a hundred pages. So where are we finding these comics? We're finding them on supermarket racks. We're finding them in Walmart, but in particular, the checkout line in American supermarkets with soap opera digests, scandal sheets, crossword puzzles. What are all these things? These are impulse buys. These are things you pick up and buy because you're waiting. These are things that your kid sees in line and is like, hey, that looks, that's a comic. I want that. Can I have that? I haven't seen those before. That looks fun. Um, and, you, and if I'm a parent and I'm like, it's $250 for two bucks, I'm like, what a value. Um, and so in an era where the visibility of all of their comics for kids is completely out of the public eye, uh, because the, the specialty market shops, you have to know about them and you have to go there and make a special trip as opposed to going to the supermarket, which you do all the time, right? So distribution is everything. And also think about something else. <clears throat> At a supermarket and your average supermarket, the cross section of people who go to these markets is a cross section of diversity in America. So people of color who may not either know about or be able to think about affording going to like a comic store, um, maybe they don't have the transportation to get there. Um, but what they do have probably is nearby supermarkets. So this is what a lot of people grew up and saw. Uh, and so uh, anecdotally, I've known a lot of African-American kids and Hispanic kids who grew up reading Archie because literally it was um, the only thing that was available. It's the only thing they saw. So despite this weirdness of like um, reading about this you know, corny white kid um, the Archie had the advantage of well-told stories that were visually appealing um, that could be understood by anyone. Um, and so as a result, uh, you know who else saw them? Girls. And remember, this is an era, again, not only were comics not aimed at girls, um, girls couldn't even find them in the 80s and 90s. Comics were out of the public eye. There weren't newsstands anymore. Um, 
so when they saw they saw these and especially it, they may have been aware of like superhero comics here and there uh or understood like you know creepy uh comic book stores this is what girls saw and they saw comics that frequently had girls as the main characters now was a lot of the storytelling sexist absolutely um but they were probably a lot of times people and i know a lot of women who grew up only seeing archie comics and it's what kind of interested and inspired them um they saw past that because the stories themselves were so well to told and well drawn and at least it was something very different from today's era when this was kind of it um one thing that archie did really well was they licensed uh video game character sonic and as a result created like a generation who grew up and this was like to them this was comics this is what they saw it was a video game character it was cool um and it had huge cross-sectional appeal boys and girls both loved this and i know more than one illustrator um who basically wanted to start drawing comics because of sonic um one last amusing thing this is from betty from 1996 about the high school going to high school in 2021 and uh other than the fashions um uh this was startlingly accurate uh as Betty is sitting in front of, of a computer with a camera on it about to go to school. Um, so with regard to Archie, his comics, I'm curious about the following. Are you familiar with them? Have you seen them? Where did you buy them or see them personally? Did you relate to the characters? Uh, and especially if you're a person who did not grow up reading superhero comics and grew up reading this how did that shape your further uh relationship to comics all right well that is it for this lecture um sorry about the break in the middle and next up we're going to have to talk about uh the next step the rise of kids comics where um, Archie was no longer the only game in town. And we'll talk about how that came to be and what that looks like now and sort of uh, how it shaped the entire industry in interesting ways. All right, thank you very much.